And finally, uh, we have a presentation from Hallie Nell Swenson, Swanson, uh, who is the first D.F. McKenzie News Scholar. Hallie is a doctoral candidate in religious studies at the University of Pennsylvania, focusing on Islam in South Asia. Her dissertation, Moving Stories, the Indo-Persian Romance, 1650 to 1850, examines the circulation of Sufi ideas through the romance genre in Persian, Dakni, Urdu, and Punjabi. She is research assistant on the Hindustani Heirs Project at the Fitzwilliam Museum, Cambridge, which spotlights a multilingual illustrated manuscript of songs from late 18th century Lucknow. Her talk is Moving Stories, the Indo-Persian Romance. All right, hi, is this, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you so much uh, for having me. I'd like to thank the BSA and especially Erin and Agnieszka. Um, my talk is entitled Moving Stories because I want to talk about how a genre meant to be moving in an emotional sense, the romance, moved around through different languages, genres, material forms, and institutions. My dissertation discusses this process in 17th to 19th century India. Um, I want to think about the materiality of genre and ask how the material dimensions of a text impact how it is read and valued. Today, I'll be talking about the movement of manuscripts um, into movable type and finally into lithograph. My focus is on a brief period of experiments with movable type romances patronized by British Orientalists in Calcutta for use as language textbooks. Their linguistic content has been the subject of scholarly interest in vernacular language standardization. But today, I want to investigate the material aspects of, how, of the books and how they use the technology of the press to adapt a genre that had previously circulated in manuscript form. Generally, the use of movable type for perso arabic script in India has been seen as a failure. From the 1840s, it was superseded by lithograph technology, which was more easily adapted to the script and its conventions. Scholars such as Francesco Ossini have seen the packaging of the romance into movable type textbooks as killing their literary potential. Later lithographs attempted to retrofit the romance textbooks back into the earlier manuscript tradition, albeit shorn of their English prefaces and credited to the author rather than to the editor and the printer. However, I think that a closer look at the movable type innovations shows that while they may not have caught on in their original form, these early experiments with print romances were not a total failure or a blip. Rather, they contained elements that would be carried forward into lithograph technology. So my focus today is on the Hindustani press in Calcutta. The press was affiliated with Fort William College, founded in 1800 as a training college for young civil servants in the British East India Company. And here's the building where the college was housed. It's still there. I walked by it the other day, but now it's a government office. Um, the college had been founded to aid the extraction of wealth from India by the East India Company, which was behaving increasingly like a state. The company hired civil servants from England and Scotland, but needed to train the young apprentices. Um, they were being taught Persian, Hindustani, and Bengali to be able to rule over the land, what Bernard Cohen has called the command of language and the language of command. But as Cecil Kumar Das has observed in his book about Fort William, there was a fundamental confusion at the heart of the college. The purpose of its teaching was entirely mercenary, yet the British Orientalists who oversaw the college's programming also saw themselves as custodians of classical learning and promoters of literary vernaculars. Meanwhile, the Indian scholars who wrote the books that were used as teaching materials saw their work as continuing and contributing to a literary tradition. Oops. Oh, there we go. Um, the Hindustani Press was started up at the college in 1802 at the request of John Borthwick Gilchrist, a Scottish surgeon and indigo planter turned teacher of Oriental languages. Gilchrist sold the idea of the press as a means for promoting a vernacular that civil servants could use across the areas increasingly held under East India Company control. And he called this vernacular Hindustani, hence Hindustani Press. Um, the title pages of books printed by the press give some idea of its purpose. Here I've highlighted a few phrases to demonstrate Gilchrist's interest in distinguishing the Hindustani language as a written and literary vehicle, the fact that stories have been packaged for exams at the college, um, and that they met with the approbation of the college council. 
The names of the printers, um, Philip Herrera and Hubbard, are sometimes given, and the names of the editors are always given. Um, in the Hatem Tai example, the editor, James Atkinson, is given the credit of revising and correcting the work under his superintendence. Um, however, the author of the actual work, um, Isatullah Bengali, is omitted. We do see references to the assistance of learned natives at the College of Fort William, who did the almost all of the editorial work, but their names are also omitted in these title pages. So who were these learned natives? To accomplish the task of producing vernacular literary material as textbooks, the college turned to a cadre of professional writers and scribed, scribes who worked in Persian and the vernacular. These men were known as munshis, a term which meant scribe, but also denoted language learning and administrative abilities. Englishmen in India often relied on them to translate correspondence and tutor them in Persian and Urdu. So here's a depiction of a munshi from an album commissioned by an English company officer showing stereotypes of different professions. So here you can see uh, the munshi is the older gentleman and this is his student. There's an inkwell and a book. Um, this is John Gilchrist's own description of the archetype of the Munshi, which indicates his deep condescension towards these professionals and their level of learning. However, he employed about 50 at the college before budget cuts began to eat into their numbers. As Lars has noted, in its early years, the college encouraged very liberally indeed editing manuscripts and producing prose works, particularly in the modern Indian languages, especially given that some of these languages did not yet have a published grammar or dictionary. Um, thus writes, quote, British professors encourage native scholars to produce works of prose, including tales and fables, the romance. Um, Gilchrist, never one to shy from self-aggrandizement, described the Hindustani press as an asylum for oriental literature. Prior to the inauguration of the press, Gilchrist had printed phrase books of his own production and compilations of short excerpts edited by Munshis through printers already operating in Calcutta. After the establishment of the press in 1802, his focus shifted to entire works written, compiled, or edited by Munshis. The source material for this flurry of production was not from scratch. Rather, incentivized by the college, the Munshis transformed pre-existing works and stories that were already in circulation. When they adapted all details to be used in the classroom, they were drawing on a long tradition of translating stories, moving them from Persian to Urdu, and changing them from poetry to prose or vice versa. Um, this chart demonstrates the importance of poetry and the prose genre of tales and fables, which can both be grouped under the framework of romance because they kept circulating um, in this process. Here we can envision how these works might have been read by the students at Fort William. This copy of the Hindustani press book has been annotated in English and pencil, possibly by the student whose name is given as Sullivan Davis on the flyleaf, along with a few doodles. The printers of the Hindustani press faced the problem of expressing the conventions of Islamic manuscript culture within the constraints of movable type. This led to some innovations. So one example is the Bismillah, which is just a blessing that inaugurates the work and appears at the top of the manuscript and just means in the name of God. So sometimes it's just a simple line of script um, as this top example here. At other times, there's an illumination around it, which is called a headpiece. And sometimes you'll see that there's space left for a headpiece, but the illumination was actually never completed as on the right here. And here you can also see the importance of ruled lines in these manuscripts. Every page has an outer frame, and then poetry is further framed into two columns, and headings are also framed. Um, but Islamic manuscripts typically lack title pages. Rather, the title is found somewhere in the preface. On the left, the text in red ink on the headpiece is the title, and in the middle image, you can see that there's a medallion serving as a kind of title page, but that's because it's from a composite codex. Um, so this is indicating that it's a second story. And you can also see on that illuminated headpiece that a former English owner, Gore Usli, has put his signature over the headpiece, which then went on to happen at the college library as well. Oh. Sorry. Yes, um, on the left there, it says College of Fort William over that line. Um, so here are three Hindustani press attempts to render the Bismillah using movable type. You can see that there seems to have been experiments in different routes, ranging from more to less elaborate. The first one is extremely simple, sequencing a few type pieces symmetrically and centering it below the Bismillah. There's a line at the top recalling the ruled lines of a manuscript, but it doesn't continue below that. Then the middle example, 
uh, has used alternating combinations of asterisks, and this one character that looks like a circle with a few dots around it, you might know the vocabulary, to designate the field of the manuscript headpiece. And it seems to approximate the finial that crowns the headpiece through the use of these two foliate characters and symmetry at the top. And meanwhile, this one actually makes a kind of elaborate throne through the use of several different movable type pieces. The use of two levels recalls some manuscripts, but to me, the, uh, the columns and finials have a slightly neoclassical look about them. This one has also used characters all the way around the text field to suggest the ruling of the entire page, more in line with the framing that we saw from the manuscript tradition, and this persists throughout the book. You can get a sense here of how this headpiece has been rendered. Um, there's one uh, character missing in where that red box is. So you can see how it was accomplished through several lines of repeating characters. My sense is that this is repurposing characters that had been developed for European books to different ends. Perhaps in a European context, they might have used just one at a time um, to separate sections, but here they're forming layers of lines with some accent pieces. So this on the right is actually a lithograph from the 1840s. It's the sixth edition of a book originally published by the Hindustani Press in Calcutta. I couldn't get an image of that first edition, but this lithograph clearly owes a lot to those early Hindustani Press innovations. Lithograph technology has allowed the printer to add in rulings around the page and between uh, sections, a concept retained from manuscript culture. But even though they are no longer constrained by the movable type medium, the printer has chosen to retain the aesthetic concept of the movable type headpiece rather than go with a more traditional headpiece. There's a double text field with finials at the top of each, but if you look closely, you can see from the lack of consistency between the two finials and the inconsistent spacing between the asterisks that they were actually done by hand. Uh, Um, one innovation of the press took advantage of the fact that English reads left to right and Arabic script right to left. Consequently, depending on which way one opened the book, you would read a different title page. This resulted effectively in two framings for the main text, one in Latin script and one in Perso-Arabic script. So here in the Persian edition of the story of Hatim Thai, the English credits James Atkinson, but leaves off the labor of the Munshi. Whereas in the Persian, the Munshi gives his own name, the Nayatullah, and mentions that it was ordered and corrected by James Atkinson. Um, and then in this example, um, oh wait. Where am I pointing? There we go. Um, the English also addresses the volume to Professor Lumsden, while the Persian addresses it to people of learning in general and specifies that its purpose is that the gentlemen of the madrasa, a college, just the um, school of the college, uh, learning Persian there may be able to read it more easily. Here too, um, the Munshi mentions his own name, Mitha Buddin, which is left off of the English. The Urdu text introducing this translation of an Arabic work mentions that the text was produced by order of Governor General Marcus Wellesley and John Gilchrist, but before mentioning them, discusses the work as being completed in the reign of the Mughal Emperor and intended for the Muslims of India. When new editions of these works were printed outside the auspices of the Hindustani press, it was these Urdu prefaces that remained, reframing the books for a different audience. The Hindustani press was more of an experiment than a publishing sensation. The college had been subject to budget cuts by the court of directors of the East India Company almost since its publication. In 1820, it canceled all publication programs. The college published 47 books during 1801 to 7, 73 books during 1808 to 14, 20 during 1815 to 20, and only one book during the next 26 years of the college's existence. In 1806, the company inspected a box of Hindustani press productions and dismissed the press's few elementary books which can claim no other rank in literature. Um, to be fair to the press, this was the exact stated purpose of its publications. As Francesco Ossini has noted, the packaging of tales as textbooks seems to have blocked the possibility that they might be recognized and appreciated also as literature. Perhaps without their conventional material form from the manuscript, um, which was intention in manuscript techno uh, technology, they failed to read as romances to readers. Appetite for movable type romances seems to have been low. And yet, however marginal the college's literary production in the form of its library and press may have been, it was not a complete blip in the literary history of Urdu. 
Some Fort William commissions did later develop a renewed sense of literariness under lithograph technology, which became dominant in the subcontinent from the mid-19th century onward. Orientalist manuscript cataloguers called lithograph presses the native presses. Lithograph preserved those features of manuscript culture that were impossible to preserve in movable type. Um, here again is the sixth edition of Nihal Chand Lahori's Urdu prose narrative, Mazhabe Ishq, which had been adapted from an earlier Persian romance, the Gole Bakavli. Um, you can see that since it's still being printed by the Hindustani press, um, they have retained the English title page, but it's now being written out by hand because it's a lithograph. Um, as we saw earlier with the headpiece from this edition, although the printer has been freed from the constraints of movable type, they've still chosen to use elements from the Hindustani press's innovations. Oh, boy. Um, for example, they keep the title medallion. Rather than being formed of movable type characters, however, as with the two Hindustani press examples below, it's a hand-drawn floral pattern. While it recalls the manuscript medallion on the right, the layers of repeated units of swells and dots are also reminiscent of the Hindustani press's headpieces, which used repeating characters. And by this lithograph from 1927 Lahore, the English title page is completely gone. You can see that the flowing script of manuscript culture has returned, and the printers are taking full advantage of the freedom of lithograph to create exciting floral motifs. However, um, the two lines below the subheadings seem to owe something to the Hindustani press innovations. And the flowers around the bismillah at the top there um, recall the res repetition of movable type forms, that kind of stamping repeated floral character. While the Hindustani press frontispieces and dedications designated the Fort William sponsored romances as exam preparation materials, the lithographed editions of the so-called native presses read more like manuscripts. The works prefaces maintain their mentions of the college and professors like Gilchrist, Hunter, and Atkinson, but in ways that cast them as patrons, omitting references to exam texts. In this way, they retain the conventions of the romance genre, positing continuity with its manuscript culture. Yet the press's innovations in orthography and punctuation, but also in the aesthetics of the books, left a lasting legacy on the material form of Urdu literary culture. Thank you.